Good evening, everyone. You may be wondering what the possible relationship could be with modern medicine and the Bible, an ancient book. The latest part of it was written nearly 2,000 years ago. The earliest parts were probably committed to writing 3,500 years ago. What can that possibly have to do with modern medicine? And for that reason, a lot of people disparage the Bible today. They think it's full of myth and legend and irrelevant. What I'd like to explore with you is the fact that, as we read together from Deuteronomy, God was pointing out to his people that there was no nation that had laws like theirs, nor wisdom like it. And what has been discovered over the last 100, 150 years, is that so much of the Bible medicine is now accepted by modern medicine. In some respects, codes that Israel had as their law three and a half thousand years ago are now understood to be medically correct by modern medicine. Now, I wonder if you recognize this man. I know it sounds a bit like Crime Watch, but uh, that wasn't the intention. He is actually rather famous because Dr. Semmelweis was a 19th century obstetrician who was deeply concerned that many mothers having uh, given birth to a healthy baby and seemingly healthy themselves, within a few days developed a fever that was often fatal. It was called childbed fever. Now, it's interesting that giving birth in the 19th century was, of course, hazardous, but it was especially hazardous in hospital. Women who gave birth in a hospital had a lower chance of survival from this disease, childbed fever, than those who were attended by midwives at home. What was even stranger was teaching hospitals had the highest mortality rate. In some hospitals, one in four women died of childbed fever, or purpural fever as it's technically called. Just imagine if four young mothers went into hospital today and only three came home, we would be very <coughs> upset at that. But the interesting thing was that uh, in the hospital where Dr. Semmelweis practiced, his patient mortality was far lower than one in four. It was eight in a thousand. It was reduced from 25% to 1%. <coughs> and the question rises, of course, why? Was he a particularly skilled obstetrician? What did he do that was different from all the other doctors? And the answer is remarkably simple. He used to wash his hands before he examined patients or delivered babies. First of all, he simply used soap and water. Later on, he was able to improve the results because he used uh, disinfectants, as we would call them today. Well, why did this make a difference? The reason was that the bacterium that caused childbed fever was actually being transmitted <coughs> on the dirty hands of doctors and medical students. You see, in those days, surgeons wore aprons, often so badly bloodstained, that it was a badge of their profession to have a badly bloodstained apron. And often they might take their overcoats off, but they would operate in their shirt sleeves. They didn't use gloves as a modern surgeon might do. They would perhaps conduct a post-mortem on a woman who died of childbed fever, and then, hardly wiping their hands on a dirty towel, would go on the wards and deliver babies and examine others. And medical students would come from the dissecting room, learning their anatomy, and again, hardly wiping their hands, would then go on the rounds with the consultants and would examine patients in the wards. <coughs> and the sad thing is that, although Dr. Semmelweis has been proved absolutely right, in his day he was condemned, he was ostracised by all his colleagues. They thought that, in fact, he was completely wrong to blame them for the spread of this disease. And it took quite some time before the ideas to be uh, were accepted. Now, today, of course, we take this for granted, don't we? And we do still have a problem in our hospitals with uh, MRSA and other uh, bacteria that cause infection. A and we know that we need to do something about this. We need to be very careful washing our hands. Uh, I'll come back to this in a few moments. But Dr. Semmelweis had discovered this uh, right at the beginning. Um, we take it for granted that if our GP needs to examine us, he would probably go and wash his hands in the basin in his uh, surgery. Uh, let's hope he uses warm water. 
and then he'll examine us and when he's finished he'll go and wash his hands again so that he doesn't take from you a disease that he can pass on to the next patient and he doesn't give you something that he's just collected from the previous patient. It breaks the cycle of transmission. Sometimes doctors rather than do that uh, wear disposable latex gloves. But the idea behind it is to stop disease being um, transmitted on unclean hands. And of course it's very important in surgery. Surgeons scrum up for quite a time performing meticulous washing of their hands and, and sterilizing them with an iodine solution and so on before they put on sterile surgical gloves and gown and mask and so on and, and then go into the operating theatre. We, we understand this. And what's fascinating is this simple procedure of hand washing saved the lives of so many women once it was adopted. But it had been part of the law of Moses, the law of Israel, 3,500 years ago. And if we were to open the book of Leviticus and go to chapter 15, we'd find that there is, I'll put it on the screen in a moment, but we'd find that this is, in fact, enshrined in the law of the land. It isn't just medical advice. God required this. And it reads as follows. Now, I'm sorry there's a lot of text on the screen, but I've um, highlighted the, the po points that, that, that we need to notice. When someone has a bodily discharge, in other words, he's got an infection <coughs> of some kind, and that could be transmitted to other people. You notice if you go through it, everything that he could possibly have touched or contaminated is regarded as unclean. Anyone who nurses him and touches his bed, they must wash their clothes and bathe with water. If he sits on something and someone else gets contaminated, he must wash his clothes and bathe with water. And it goes on. If someone accidentally is spat upon by that, that, that infected man, if he coughs on you, that person must wash their clothes, bathe in water, and be considered unclean, that is, potentially infectious, till evening. And it goes all the way through this repeated procedure that if you come into contact with someone who is potentially <laughs> infectious and has a disease that can be transmitted, then washing clothes and bathing with water is essential. But the bit that I find absolutely marvellous is here in the 11th verse. Anyone the man with a discharge touches without rinsing his hands in water must wash his clothes and bathe with water and he'll be unclean, that is potentially infective, until the evening. So three and a half thousand years ago, the law of Moses recognised that it's possible to transmit disease with unwashed hands. And I just want you to notice the next verse. It's talking about a clay pot the man touches has to be broken, but a wooden article can be rinsed with water. We'll come back to that a little later in our talk. And then when the man is better, he's to count seven days to make sure he really is no longer infectious. And then he must wash his clothes, bathe himself with fresh water, and then he is considered as clean. Now, we still haven't learned the lesson. This is a photograph I took in our local doctor's surgery. As you go in, please use a hand sanitizer on entering the building. In order that you don't bring something into the building when you touch your door handle or whatever, you contaminate it and someone else picks it up. It's quite interesting to sit in the waiting room and notice how few people actually use this. And apparently it's just as bad in hospitals and some of the worst offenders, sadly, are the medical staff. We haven't learnt the lesson three and a half thousand years on. And the law continues, a woman who becomes pregnant and gives birth to a son will be ceremonially unclean for seven days. Now that's rather nice, because this is again a way of preventing the disease spreading. You assume that she might be carrying this disease of childbed fever, and so for seven days you treat her as though she was infected. And in that way, if she was to, to eventually develop the disease, at least you've stopped it spreading. And anyone who touches a dead body which equally might be contaminated with some infectious uh, disease. They too have to uh, uh, go through this procedure of cleansing themselves, purifying themselves, washing and so on. And I hope you've noticed at the bottom, I've highlighted verse 15, every open container without a lid fastened on it will be unclean. Now just briefly, this is fascinating. It anticipates the work of Louis Pasteur by over 3,000 years. Pasteur was famous because he discovered that food became, uh, went bad or became infected if it was open to the air because the air is full of spores of bacteria. They land on the food, they multiply, 
and it goes bad and if you're not careful you get food poisoning. He discovered this by some very uh, elegant experiments where he showed it wasn't the air that was the problem because if you put cotton wool in, in the container or seal it in some way or in a long, long winding neck on a flask, air was getting in but the cotton wool prevented the bacterial spores from moving through or they settled in the long neck of the vessel. He was able to show that it wasn't a sort of spontaneous thing that caused food to go bad. It was the presence of bacterial spores in the air. And the law of nature <coughs> says every open container without a lid fastened on it is potentially a source of infection and food poisoning. So these laws, these three simple laws, would stop child fever, childbed fever spreading. After the birth of the baby, the mother was considered potentially infectious for several days. If she didn't develop the disease, no harm done, but you assumed she might. Then this procedure of hand washing and personal hygiene would prevent the spread of the disease if it broke out. And the rules for uh, handling a dead body, of course, uh, would also prevent the contamination from spreading to other people and infecting them. It's quite interesting that uh, the Jews had a, a, a reputation for medical skills. Many of the personal physicians of kings and emperors and rulers and the wealthy in Europe, almost, al almost always their professional medical helper was Jewish. Um, it actually caused sometimes uh, uh, problems, of course, because when plagues struck the Jewish quarter of, of a city, the people there hardly were affected by it, whilst the rest of the city would perhaps be wiped out. And they held that somehow the Jews were in league with the devil, and, and therefore anti-Semitism was often right. The real reason, of course, was they were following God's laws of health and hygiene, and therefore they did not suffer like the rest of the people. And actually it's quite interesting because you know, many of these 19th century medical men read their Bibles. They were religious. But they didn't seem to notice that in Mark's Gospel in the New Testament, the Pharisees and all the Jews wouldn't eat unless they gave their hands a ceremonial washing. Actually, they washed it three times as far <coughs> as the elbow. And when they came from the market, they washed their hands before um, they, they sat down to eat. Now, this concern with washing, surely somebody would say, why? And then perhaps they'd realise that this was preventing the spread of food poisoning. So we asked the question, how many thousands of young women's lives might be saved if these simple procedures in the Lord Moses had been followed? Here's a, a, an excellent example of a modern medical practice which the Jews actually had as part of their law. And God said, what nation had such righteous laws as these and such wisdom? And the reason was, of course, they were God-given. Uh, another portrait, this time I won't have you guessing who it is, it's Lord Lister. Joseph Lister, of course, so many hospitals in this country are named after him because he was the father of modern aseptic surgery. Uh, he discovered that if you use an antiseptic spray over the area in which you were operating, the chances of the wound becoming infected were lower. Uh, and later on, of course, we now realise that we can do the same thing by excluding bacteria from the air, and so every operating theatre has a... a, a, a an air system that sterilizes the air by filtration and so the chances of, of an infection are reduced. And he made a wonderful tribute to Semmelweis. Without Semmelweis, my achievements would be nothing. To this great son of Hungary, surgery owes much. Well, the Victorians also had their achievements. They had a saying that cleanliness is next to godliness and they appreciated the importance of personal and public hygiene. They, constructed waterworks to make sure that drinking water was uh, potable, fit to drink. They had a wonderful system of sewers to dispose of human waste and so on. And in addition, they built public wash houses and public baths. And I, I don't mean <coughs> swimming baths, I mean places where there were bathrooms and baths where people had a supply of hot water and soap and could have to take a bath. Because often they had neither of these facilities in their own home. Do you realise, of course, this is exactly what the Jews did three and a half thousand years ago? washing clothes and washing themselves and bathing and being regarded as uh, potentially infectious until they had done that and waited till the evening. Now, it's not so long ago that uh, hygiene, personal hygiene, you know, w w was absent in the majority of the, the population. It's said that Queen Elizabeth I used to take a bath once a year even when she didn't need one. 
<laughs> and you can see now why Elizabethans went around with nosegays, you know, something that smelled nice, <laughs> because it counteracted the B.O. that was rife. And it's not very long since that children were sometimes sewn into their clothes in the autumn and not unpicked until the uh, following um, spring. Uh, and, you know, in my own childhood, we, we, we didn't have an in indoor bathroom. We had an outside toilet, and many of the children at school I attended uh, had no water closet at all, not even outside. And it's not all that long ago. I know I'm getting on a bit, but it's not all that long ago that things that we take for granted today were relatively rare amongst the majority of the population. Now, the next item is not very pleasant. It's about infectious skin diseases. Uh, I often tell the story here that, uh, that you know, if you want to scratch, please feel free to do so. Uh, often when you suggest something like this, people suddenly discover itches. But the technique is very interesting. Here's someone who's got a disease that could be transmitted, a skin disease. And what happens is that they are examined by the priest to decide how serious it is, whether it's a serious condition or not. The priest examines them and decides they were ceremonially unclean, that is potentially infectious. Uh, and, and they look at, at the uh, condition and they may be decide that the person could be infected. And so on the last line, in, in yellow, they put the infected person in isolation for seven days. That's what we call quarantine. It comes from the Latin, sorry, the Italian word for 40, caranta, because that was the period when if a ship came into, towards the harbour but had disease on board, they used to run up a special flag, I think it was called the Yellow Duster, and that said, we've got disease on board, we, we, we can't um, come into harbour until we're sure that the disease is, is finished. And they stayed there for 40 days, because it was assumed by that time every, either everyone would be better, or sadly everyone would have died. And the reason, of course, is very simple. If these sailors, after a long voyage, once they got to shore, they'd be going to their homes, wouldn't they, and meeting their families. And if they were infected, they'd spread it then throughout the town, and then in other cities, perhaps. And before long, there would be an epidemic. And so this idea of quarantine, setting people apart who are infected, uh, is a very good medical procedure. It's not so long ago we used to have isolation hospitals. I remember my late father telling me about any child that had scarlet fever was rushed off to an isolation hospital. And we still have diseases today, for example, lassa fever and viral hepatitis, for which we have no cure, no treatment. All we can do is try and nurse the patient and, and, and hope their own sort of health enables them to overcome the disease. And those who care for them, the nurses and the doctors who care for them, of course, have to be very careful in order to ensure that they themselves don't become infected. And so these procedures uh, are important. Uh, he's kept in isolation, that's the key thing, and he's checked from time to time. Uh, and eventually, it, if, if it doesn't get any better, the last line is, it is an infectious disease. And so something <coughs> must be done about it. I don't know if you've noticed, but very often in pictures of the Far East, and sometimes Chinese and Japanese people in this country, will be seen wearing face masks. This is to stop the spread of disease. Who first thought of this? I think you know what's coming. The Jews thought of it three and a half thousand years ago. A person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes to show people that they are probably contagious. They let their hair be unkempt and cover the lower part of their face and cry, unclean, unclean. And as long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone, he must live outside the camp. It's a voluntary quarantine, but in order to prevent the spread of the disease, they cover the lower part of their face. And so this person remains in isolation to prevent the spread of the disease, and the lower part of his face is to be covered. And of course, uh, it's not so long ago that we had SARS, severe acute respiratory syndrome, <coughs> and everyone was wearing masks uh, to, to prevent this. Now, it's very interesting, actually. How do they work? The strange thing is that a bacterium or a virus is so small, uh, an ordinary problem, <coughs> the holes in that, when you magnify them up, are far, far too big. But that isn't how it's spread. Infectious diseases are spread when we cough or sneeze and tiny droplets of water 
carry the bacterium or the virus. And they are too big to go through the mask. And so whether you cough inside the mask, it prevents it spreading outside, or if someone coughs near you and you breathe through the mask, it prevents the disease from spreading. So that's rather nice, isn't it? The, the Jews, again, three and a half thousand years ago, knew how to stop the spread of disease. Now, sanitation, again, is a very important factor. The Victorians, we said, they built sewers and sewage treatment facilities. And it's considered that today the majority of infectious diseases are waterborne diseases, usually caused by inadequate waste disposal and the contamination of drinking water. And more people die from these than just about anything else in the world. Diseases like cholera that are rife in many parts of the world, typhoid, and some parasitic diseases like bilharzia are spread in this way. Now, again, the Jews had a, loop, a rule for this. They were to designate a place outside the camp where they relieved themselves and they were to cover their excrement when they had done so. They didn't have a privy over the local stream, as you find in many third world countries. With children playing in the river, stream downstream, sometimes women washing their clothes in the same contaminated water. They had a procedure. Uh, and it really does you know, contrast with the techniques in medieval Europe. Um, it's rather amusing in a way, you know, where chamber pots were just emptied into the street. If you go to York, and the city of York, there is a medieval section called the Shambles. Typical Tudor housing, the walls go up either side, and then there's an overhang, and it goes up again an overhang. And, and people um, could almost shake hands across the street at the top. And of course, um, it's led to a condition that I have, which I find very difficult to overcome. If I'm walking with a, a lady, either Angela or perhaps a colleague at work, I have to walk on the outside of the pavement. I can't stop it because I was brought up to this. I feel terribly uncomfortable if I'm on the inside. And this was a custom that arose from this medieval attitude where you took a chamber pot, opened the window and tipped it out into the street. <laughs> now, fortunately, the lady would perhaps be under the overhang of the building and she'd be safe. But the gentleman, of course, had to take what came. Sometimes people were reasonably thoughtful and they would shout, Gardy Lou, meaning look out below. Uh, but, you know, it meant that the streets, of course, were dreadful in terms of the potential for the spread of disease. And so disposal of uh, human waste is, is, is obviously uh, very important. One of the ironies today, of course, is that the water <coughs> that comes into our homes is, is bacteriologically pure. We can drink it. And the irony is that we spend 90% of it just simply flushing toilets. The Jews didn't do that. Water couldn't be wasted in that way. They used what we call the dry method of disposal. And it may well come back. There are scientists looking at this as a, as a problem, as water shortages, not just in this country, but in many other countries of the world, are, are increasing. And there was a very famous uh, incident in, in London with a, a Dr. Snow. He was a London physician made many really wonderful contributions to medicine, but he studied the spread of one cholera epidemic, and in, it was in 1854, and he noted the location of each new victim. And he suddenly decided that there was something that it all centred on, and that was a pump in Broad Street, and it's there today as a memorial to his work. Now, you may notice something odd about this pump, As a cockney might say, it ain't got no handle. And the reason was Dr. Snow took it off. You see, this pump was the source of the prevention of the, the disease, and he wanted to prevent it. Somehow the water being pumped up had become contaminated with cholera, perhaps seeping you know, from, from human waste that, that shouldn't have been in the water supply. And by taking the handle off, people had to go somewhere else to get their water. And thankfully, after a little while, the epidemic um, died out. And so he was uh, able to uh, substantiate the idea that this was a water uh, spread disease and, uh, and he, he realised that uh, this, even though he couldn't see the organism, didn't know what it was, but he was pretty sure uh, this, this is what it was. And, and therefore he made quite a, a wonderful uh, contribution to medical science. Well, I think we all know a little bit about Jewish 
uh, dietary laws, and they're again conducive to health. Uh, it pro prohibits pig meat and pig meat products. And the irony is that before we had this problem of salmonella in chickens, the majority of food poisoning outbreaks were traceable to pig meat and pig meat products. And they're still a very substantial cause of, of death and, and suffering. Often it seems to be that it, it occurs uh, towards the north of England and Scotland. I don't know why that is. It seems to be a northerly thing. And it's very common in, in institutions, uh, old people's homes and so on. But we now understand how, how this comes about, and, and I'll explain it uh, in a moment. Certain animals uh, you could eat. You could eat oxen, sheep, goats, deer, gazelles, and so on. And the rule was you could eat any animal that has a split hoof, divided in two, and that chews the cud. And this simple rule enabled the Jews to decide which animals uh, they could eat and which they couldn't. Now, there are a couple of problems here. There are some animals that have a split hoof, uh, such as the camel, or the rabbit, or the hyrax, that is the rock cone. They uh, chew the cud, they don't have a split hoof, and therefore you can't eat them. Uh, I've never tried camel meat, I understand it's quite tough. I'm told the Bedouin have a very good way of dealing with, with the camel meat. They, they cook it in a bowl over an open fire, and they put a couple of pebbles in. And when the pebbles are soft, the meat's ready. <laughs> now, of course, the pig is unclean because although it has a divided hoof, it doesn't chew the cud. Uh, and therefore, you're not to eat their meat, says the law, or uh, their cows. Now, why? Well, I've already said that pig meat is, is, is often a, a source of uh, food poisoning. And don't forget, the Jews didn't have refrigeration. And we have a cookery book, quite an old cookery book at home, that warns you well, must not eat pork when there isn't an R in the month. That is between May and August, the warmer months. When I was a boy, the only people in our area that had a refrigerator was the local uh, corner shop. Most people perhaps had a meat safe, which all it did was stop flies from laying their eggs on the meat. You might have had a cold lard or a cold slab, but refrigeration was not there. And that was true in Israel. And, and so this danger of uh, pork products uh, causing food poisoning was quite uh, important. And you know, the trouble is, Pigs and humans have a great deal in common. Influenza is a disease which we believe we have caught from pigs, largely in those countries where pigs live in close association with human beings, for example, the Far East. And uh, we've retaliated because uh, swine vesicular disease is apparently a disease that pigs have caught from us. But the closeness is very interesting. Insulin used to be extracted from the pancreas of pigs and then it could be used for humans with diabetes. But now we use uh, genetically modified bacteria. It's interesting, isn't it? We apparently are worried about genetically modified tomatoes, but we seem to be quite happy with the idea of taking bacteria and allowing them to make insulin that humans can do. And of course, pigs are very like, much like us in other ways. I know it's, it perhaps feels a bit insulting, but they're often used for medical research for that very reason. There is a pig called the medical pig. It looks like an ordinary pig, but on very long legs, you see, because all the other organs of a pig are about the size of human organs. The heart, the lungs, and so on, very similar, but the legs aren't. And so if you're an orthopedic surgeon and you want to develop better ways of, of, of de dealing with uh, joint problems or fractures, whatever it might be, this medical pig, it looks like a pig almost on stilts, has been used. And if, if you, you want to test things like the dressings for wounds, I, I, I know someone who... Uh, his company researches this, and they use pigs because pig skin is pretty well hairless, like ours. Other animals wouldn't be suitable. And a tra transgenic pig is now being developed, I believe in Cambridge. They're trying to f put some human genes into a pig to get over the problem of lack of organs for transplanting. The idea being that if we can change a pig's genetic makeup, then its heart, its lungs, whatever, might be usable for human transplant surgery. The only danger is, and this is something that's wor worrying the uh, researchers, pigs might be carrying something that doesn't affect them, but when the organ is transplanted into a human being it might in fact be counterproductive because it might have a, a condition which affects the patient. So it, it's in early days, but that similarity between pigs and human beings is a very important. Now, 
The other thing you can't uh, do is eat creatures from the water without fins and scales. It couldn't be simple, could it? If it doesn't have fins and scales, you're not to eat it. Now why? Well, bivalve shellfish, oysters, mussels, cockles, clams, etc., are filter feeders. They filter the seawater through their gills and they collect fine particles of organic matter uh, that's in the seawater. Well, normally that's perhaps not too serious. But the one place they really love to live is the end of a sewage outfall at sea because food is raining down on them all day. And any pathogenic bacteria uh, will, of course, be concentrated in their gills and then in their intestines. And so if you then eat a, 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 mus a mussel or, or a cockle that's been fi filter feeding under these conditions, well, there's a quite a danger you might pick up something nasty. And so the law in Britain requires you to put these creatures in clean seawater for 24, 48 hours in the hope that all this material will pass through their bodies before you eat them. Um, the only problem with oysters is they're normally eaten raw and alive, so do be warned. And of course many crustaceans, crabs, lobsters and so on, and scavengers and may also be uh, risky. And it is known that uh, after pig products, in the past, <coughs> seafood, mussels and so on were often a cause of food poisoning. So it's very simple really, you know, you can see it's got scales and you see it's got fins, so you can eat it. Jews don't eat eels. Now eels do have scales but they're microscopic so they keep away from eels. And of course if it's shellfish again you can you see it's not got any scales, it hasn't got any fins and so under the law of Moses it's wise not to eat them. Now there is another uh, point. Say to the Israelites do not eat any of the fat of cattle, sheep or goats. Now you may not be able to spell cholesterol, I'm never sure quite how it's spelled. <laughs> But we now know that a high fat diet is bad for us. <coughs> we often you know, have measurements on our blood cholesterol levels in the hope that we won't far, fur up our arteries. Uh, and, and high fat disease is linked to certain bowel disorders as well. And even just obesity. The Jews did not eat fat. They could use it for other purposes, lubricating uh, the axle of a, uh, of a cart or whatever, but they weren't to eat it. And the other law, which is important in Leviticus 3, then we're not to eat any fat or any blood. Why no blood? Well, I began to try and research this, and I wondered whether the Maasai uh, tribe in, in, in South Africa that not only milk their cattle but bleed them and use that as a food source might have a disease that's peculiar to them. I haven't found anything yet, but it may well be the case. But recently, have you noticed, there have been a lot of concern about red meat. Now the Jews not only bled the animal's carcass when they slaughtered it, but very strict Jews would often then soak the red meat in water to extract as much of the blood as possible. And there is a belief now that high amounts of red meat are a possible cause of bowel cancer and other diseases. So again, it may well be that God's wisdom here in suggesting that we uh, keep out blood as much as possible in our diet uh, w would mean that we are going to be much healthier. The sad thing is the black pudding, which a lot of people like, is just blood with lots of fat in it, so you get twice of it, twice of the amount of, <coughs> in, in a black pudding. One interesting thing, I've got to be careful what I say here, Alcohol was not forbidden to the Jews. Now Muslims don't drink and certain Christian sects do not drink alcohol, but the Jews were not forbidden. The law here says that if they want to celebrate, they could uh, use their money, verse 26, to buy wine or other fermented drink, anything they wish, and they would then rejoice before the Lord. Now, we have to be careful, of course. Um, the Bible warns about excessive alcohol consumption, but it can be conducive to health. Timothy was told by Paul to cease from just drinking water, but use a little wine for his stomach and his other illnesses. And what's fascinating is, study after study has shown that people who drink in moderation, on average, live longer than teetotalers. Now, please don't go away tonight saying our lecturer is <laughs> advocating alcohol. But it's a fact. It's interesting. The Lord Moses didn't forbid it in moderation. And medical science, and I've read a lot of studies of this, 
has shown that it can, in moderation, be beneficial. Uh, we're not quite sure why, but I remember a little while ago when uh, uh, our local GP was doing some research and uh, they wanted to look at uh, cholesterol levels in people of various age groups, you know, 20s, 30s, <coughs> to see whether sometime down the line those with high cholesterol might turn up in the, the, the cardiac unit at the local hospital. And uh, when they were taking a, a, a sample of blood from me, I was asked, uh, you know, was I teetotal? I said, no, I, well, what do you like? I, I rather like red wine with a male. Oh, that's, that's fine. It's very good for uh, lowering cholesterol. But you see, there's a danger. This particular uh, medical person, she said to me, you know, we're on a hiding to nothing here. If we recommend it, people will assume that if a little is good for you, a lot's very good for you. <laughs> and you'll end up with a nation with fantastic hearts but short livers. So it is a balance, but it is interesting, isn't it, that of, of the major re religions, this is uh, one, the Judaists, Judaism would not uh, forbid it, although the Bible does actually uh, recommend that it's in moderation. Now another interesting thing, we mentioned earlier um, the problem of no, no uh, refrigeration. And here notice that the meat which is offered, they could eat it on the day they sacrificed it and on the next day, but anything left over had to be uh, burned. And of course, you know, we, we, know don't we, that we can keep meat that's been cooked in the fridge for a few, quite a few days. But 50 to 100 years ago, the risk would be that it might eventually cause food poisoning if, if it was in, infected or contaminated in any way. And so the Jews could keep it the second day, but on the third day they had to burn it. And again, this will prevent uh, food poisoning. Now, one of the most fascinating things I've discovered recently is about different materials and their tendency to promote or prevent disease. Now, this is the law about an animal, say a mouse or something, falls on food in your lap. If it's made of wood, cloth, hide, leather, or sackcloth, you can put it in water, you wash it. But if it's a clay pot, everything will be unclean, you must break the pot. Now, what's the distinction? Why is it? Uh, as we said with this gentleman earlier on with the infectious disease, the clay pot the man touches must be broken, but a wooden article is to be rinsed with water. Why? Well, the difference is quite interesting. I thought originally this was odd because wood is slightly porous. A clay pot is definitely porous and I could understand that if a liquid that was contaminated got into the pores of the pot, even though you might rinse it, if you put a liquid in again, say milk or something, then the bacteria in the pores could move out and contaminate the milk. Why is wood different? Well, it's very interesting. Wood is porous but it has a natural bacterial inhibitor. It stops bacterial growth. Now, think about my boyhood. I remember the local butcher. He had a block for chopping the wood. It was beech wood, usually. And each day, at the end of the day, the butcher's boy would scrub the, the block. There was never a problem. But then the European community came along and said, oh, this is rather medieval. What we need is plastic. So the butchers got plastic blocks, and then the trouble started. You could show within a short time they were contaminated with bacteria and it was very difficult to get rid of them because they were living in the scratches on the surface of the plastic. So we went back to wood, didn't we? Oh no, no one's going to admit they got it wrong. What we have now is plastic that behaves like wood. What they've done is take plastic chopping boards and put in an antibacterial uh, material called microban and so this plastic Choppy board, and this is not a commercial break, it just happens to be that Sainsbury's make and sell this. It behaves like wood. But God has given us a natural antibacterial product called wood. But, you know, oh no, we've got to do it scientifically. And so we've made an imitation wood. And so you can now buy plastic chopping boards that mimic wood. But how did the Jews three and a half thousand years ago? know that wood behaved like this. See, I've mentioned this under, to some of my scientific colleagues, and they always say, oh, well, they probably learned by trial and error. Well, why does it take three and a half thousand years for us to learn by trial and error some of the other things that the Jews knew about? Finally, houses fit for human habitation. It's, it's, it's really wonderful, this. It wasn't just diet and, and 
health and hygiene and so on, just the living conditions <coughs> under which people lived in those days. God required under the law of Moses that houses should be fit for human habitation, particularly with regard to fungal growths. Now, we've had a problem in our own time with this, haven't we? When those large high-rise blocks, of tower blocks of flats were built in many of our cities, the people who lived in them often couldn't afford to heat the house with electricity. So they resorted to paraffin heaters. Now, a gallon of paraffin produces a larger quantity of water. It condenses on the walls that are cold. The walls become damp. They're ideal for bacteria and fungi and microbes in general to grow on. These produce spores and children end up with respiratory diseases as a consequence. So we've really almost produced high-rise slums by doing that. Now, one of the creatures that cause a lot of problems is dry rot. It's a nasty thing if you have it in your house. It's usually caused by a lack of ventilation. And uh, the only way you can deal with it is to be ruthless. A builder will cut away all the wood that's infected. Um, if there's brick and stone, they might try and sterilise that with a blow lamp or some strong chemical. It's not easy to eradicate. You have to take away everything that could be potentially infected and sterilise what's left and then replace it with uh, new timber, new bricks, new concrete, uh, uh, as required. Do you know the Jews knew that three and a half thousand years ago? If you enter the land of Canaan and there's a house with spreading mildew or some other fungal infection, the priest now acts as a chartered surveyor. He looks at the house and he decides there's a problem. So he asks the house to be emptied so he can examine it properly. Interesting, I know you've had a, a house survey done but the most economic ones tend to have statements like, I wasn't able to uh, examine the condition of the floorboards because of fitted carpets. Or they didn't know about that damp patch behind the wardrobe. You know, you, the only way you can really do a full survey is to empty the house. That's what the Jews did. And then the priest went in and he inspected the house. And he's looking for evidence of fungal infections. And then he will close it up for seven days. You go back after seven days, and if it's spread on the walls, then the contaminated stones are to be torn out and thrown into an unclean place outside the town. <coughs> and that's lovely, because that's exactly what we do now. And it goes on, all the inside walls of the house must be scraped, that is all the plaster, which of course is porous and might have spores in it, are taken away and dumped in an unclean place outside the town. And then other stones and new clay is used to plaster the house. Again, exactly what we would do today. And then, of course, um, if that's no longer a solution, if it doesn't work, then this house, well, first 45, it must be torn down, it's stones, timber, and all the plaster, and it must be taken out of the town to an unclean place. Slum clearance. The Jews realised that if a house was unfit for human habitation, then it had to be removed. Now, we haven't time to look at some of the other things and perhaps they're not particularly appropriate for a public lecture, but the law deals with sexually transmitted diseases, which are still a big problem in the world. And it also had positive things. It provided for rest and re recuperation. The Sabbath, for example. Every seven days, you had a day off. Many of the other ancient civilizations did not have that. They had a week, sometimes 15 days, sometimes 30 days. This was very, very beneficial. We already realize the benefit of this today, although sadly the Sunday is just like any other day and I think that will have its consequences. And they had feasts, religious holidays, something to look forward to. People need this. And that again was very uh, advantageous. And finally of course they had retirement for those who were too elderly to work, continue to work. Now I'm quoting now from a, a, a book, not a Christadelphian book, it's uh, by a man called Rosner, talking about medicine of the Bible and the Talmud, which of course is a Jewish document. He says, although the Bible is not a medical text, its historical accounts, laws and precepts, even its wording, yield an abundant harvest of information concerning the structure of the human body, diseases, injuries, cares, and above all, preventative and sanitary procedures. The material contained in some portions of the Pentateuch, that is the Lord Moses, is so factual that even the sophisticated present-day student cannot help but be amazed at what he reads there, especially the sanitary regulations of cleanliness and purity, such as the prohibition against the consumption of blood and quarantines for infectious diseases. These are unique, 
and do not occur in the codes of the civilized nations of antiquity that surround the land of Israel. We've got a lot of medical papyri from Egypt. Egyptians were very good at dealing with wounds, fractures and so on, but they knew nothing about preventative medicine. I mean, would you think it a good idea to make a poultice of crocodile dung to put on an ulcer? You know, my impression would be that it would just make it worse. They had no idea, even though they were a very civilised nation, they had nothing. And that's what we read together, wasn't it? No other nation round had laws like the, the Jews had three and a half thousand years ago. Well, what do we conclude from all this? Well, I think we've seen that the Bible contains medical information way ahead of its time. I would suggest it's supernatural information. It's not the kind of thing you would necessarily stumble on across three and a half thousand years ago. And it seems to me it's evidence for an origin of the Bible quite independent of human knowledge. And the book itself, of course, claims to be from God. <coughs> so although it's not primarily a book about science or medicine, that only takes up a very small fraction of the total book, but it does deal with some other fundamental questions which can't be answered from any other source. Now, Suppose you went to the doctor and you said, Doctor, why am I here? He said, no, wait a minute, I usually ask the question, why are you here? <laughs> and he might say, no, you, you say to him, no, no, what's the purpose of life? You know, wh why are we here on this planet? You might say to your doctor, what happens when we die? <coughs> well, you say, uh, the heart stops and uh, then the brain, of course, sees the function, some other organ. He said, no, 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 I don't want to know about the medical process of dying. I want to know, is there life to life? Oh, medical science can't tell you that. Is there life after death? They don't know. Some people have had near-death experiences and seem to think that's the case, but there are good physiological explanations of those experiences. And on a wider scale, what, what is the world coming to? And again, science can't necessarily answer those. But it seems to me that what we've discovered from the Bible's medical information is that it is an outstanding book. You see, the law of Moses didn't get rid of the consequences of sin and death. But it did enhance the quality of life for those Jews who followed its code. <coughs> and if we go further forward into the New Testament, the gospel message is offering something even better. Not just a more pleasant and fulfilled quality of life now, but a message of eternal life in the future. So if that's the case, let's take this book and read it for all it's worth.